Chogna Wocheke Wan Kaha picked a head church. Lexi Choli Web Buffalo, Wocheke Wanyakaho Yaki here. Please, Epre. So I want to welcome all of you that are here and the purpose of this is to uh, hopefully try to give you some history of Lakota Dictionary, Dakota, a lot to cover, and I know our time is, is, uh, is going to be kind of stretched, so we're going to try to um, get as much as we can and to leave room for any questions or comments. Okay, so we need a new Lakota Dictionary, because we have plenty of dictionaries. We have, there's a lot of, lot of dictionaries out there already. You might remember Johnson Holy Rock, Holy Rock really well-respected elder, uh, contributed a lot to this, uh, very much for the research and for the uh, development of this new Lakota Dictionary. So those are just two of the over 400 fluent translations, the narratives that these different elders, uh, their recordings, they, they are all, they, they were still adding more of those recordings to, to, the, um, to, the, to the different, uh, to the new dictionary. So there's, and so for the Lakota elders, that contributed, that helped, that gave their time, their patience, they aren't around anymore. And it doesn't mean that they, it doesn't mean to imply that when they're acknowledged in these dictionaries that, they're, that they make. And I'm glad that, that that distinction is made. So these words that are recorded from elders, uh, they, all, they all come from fluent Lakota speakers. So it's really the first Lakota dictionary that comes from all uh, Lakota speakers, the examples, the example sentences, and that's, that's something that's really, uh, it's unique, uh, her video that she did. Okay, so let's go back, I'm gonna take you back in time because we always say Lakota is a oral language in which all native languages are, but there's a beginning to everything. So there was a beginning to when on the Pond Brothers, they were missionaries in Minnesota area back in the 1830s. And their, their wish was to, uh, not really to save Dakota, not really to preserve the Dakota language, but it was to, was made to translate the Bible into Dakota language. And so after this Dakota translation of the Bible, then other words were added uh, for this dictionary. So the person he edited and published that Dakota Dictionary, now we know it as the Riggs Dictionary. Now, like I said, the main goal of these Pond Brothers was, to, was for evangelism. And so, and it doesn't take anything away from the, the win of that they were not linguist. And so when they did translations of Dakota, they were not trained linguist. And so it's, um, there's some problems that come along with it that we'll see. After Riggs, this name, Father Eugene Beekle, and he has a museum over in St. Francis named after him with a lot of his artifacts over there. And so we want to keep in mind this timeline of that Dakota dictionary. Came to Pine Ridge, came to Rosebud. He was a missionary here for a very long time. And what he did is his attempt was not to make a Bible, not to translate the Bible into Lakota, but he did uh, translate stories and different things. And so in his, uh, you can see in his possessions that are, are at the Marquette Jesuit archives, he has the Riggs Dictionary, Dakota Dictionary, with his own handwritten uh, notes in the margins. 
into Lakota. And so, for example, he took Dakota words and he tried to uh, just remove or switch out certain letters. Uh, and that's something that still exists today. A lot of people think that we can take a D out of the word boy in Nakota is Hokshina. The word for boy in Lakota is Hokshila. And the word for boy in Dakota is doi. Yes. No. <laughs> but you see that attempt where you think you can switch out an N or an L or a D, and we will see that it doesn't work like that. So there are a lot of words uh, that have similar, that are, are said similar, or used similar. So we have shonka and wea. But then there's a lot of words that are different in Dakota and Lakota. So for example, dress in Lakota, we say chwignaka. And in Dakota, it's Sanksanicha. Now, at the same time Biko was doing this, just amazing. So Ella Deloria, she was Dakota, and uh, her parents were from Yankton. But she uh, moved, they moved to Standing Rock when she was around, I think, one or two years old. And so she grew up as anthropologist. And at that time, there's still not a Lakota dictionary in existence. And what she did is she also took Riggs's dictionary. So you have Beekle working on Riggs's dictionary, and you have Ella Deloria working on Riggs's dictionary. Doing that, she made Lakota variants for over 20,000 entries. So it's kind of ironic that they're both doing the same thing at the same time, but they didn't even know anything about each other. So when you're writing, her notes as she takes the Lakota or the Dakota word and then writes the Lakota equivalent next to it. Some of the help that for this new Lakota dictionary, all these words from Riggs's Dakota dictionary, from Beekle's work in matched up. Now, so here are some examples. Now, in to say to be hungry, like uh, for Lakota speakers, how do we say to be hungry? Okay. So Riggs wrote in Dakota, in the Dakota Lochin. So Deloria, who was a, a fluent Lakota speaker, she wrote Lochin next to the Dakota uh, entry for Wotekteda. So Biko, he converted Wotekteda, changes the sound, but it makes the word the same. But we see that it's not. And so this word that Biko has in the Biko dictionary is not recognized by Lakota speakers and does not show up in any old text. Cause we, and we know that the word to be hungry. So to be hungry, we have Riggs's definition in Dakota, Deloria's note on the side, Lochi, and we have Biko, he took directly. So Biko, he not only created words based on his assumptions and uh, dialect variants, but he borrowed uh, incorrect entries and definitions for rigs, from Riggs. So here's, here's an example of this, is that Riggs and directly uh, used it in his dictionary, Yasni, and gave it the same definition. Okay, Ash, according to Lakota speakers who were consulted, Yasni means to cool by speaking. So that's just an example of, of how this, this, uh, these dictionaries, when you take one word, the definition, and they're not checked by Lakota speakers, it can carry on. Here's another, um, here's another example, Oglu. So ovaries that are created over the years, almost 120, 30, 40 years, we have Oglu uh, giving, being given life again as a word in all of these different dictionaries. But Oglu as a noun, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't exist. Okay, so, but we can see that it's, it's, and so the assumption from uh, going back to Riggs, is, it comes from like, so Oglushicha is, is a mistake, like to mess up. And, and so there was a, uh, a misconception that if, and so there was just those examples of those, of those kind of uh, misunderstandings from non Lakota speakers that, uh, that's continued to go on. She didn't know what it was. 
she either didn't know what it was, she hadn't heard it, or she hadn't been, uh, she hadn't heard it being used. And so what she did was she put a question mark beside those words because she was not even sure. 5,000 entries in the Beco Dictionary for which Deloria suggested different words or were uh, otherwise problematic. Chailuk Chahantash, 35% of the words that are in the Beco Dictionary that he borrowed from Riggs, the Dakota, were not recognized by fluent native speakers born in Seven Matei that she borrowed. They, uh, they took just identical. They, they brought them just across identical, and they're very rarely any uh, new addictors. Okay, so uh, the one thing that happened during this time is that when um, Deloria was doing her research and making her notes, uh, Deloria, who was a, a fluent speaker, she kind of developed her own orthography to make sure that that um, and Laura will kind of get into this why why it's important these different sounds and after uh, after a while when Biko saw some of Deloria's work that was published then it actually started to uh, redo his own dictionary his own words and but unfortunately he passed away before he could um, get to that point where it could be published and the man that is this dictionary right here. And so Manhart, when Manhart took over, then he, he took a lot of Beekle's work. And instead of keeping some of this, this new orthodoxy, so this is what we come up with. Uh, and this was Paul Manhart's, and his conversion was done inconsistently, and then making the spelling unreliable. And when Laura talks about the spelling and the orthography, you will see why, why it's so important. What is it about? Well, it's the result, and it's the result of consistently checking, consistently checking with Lakota speakers and publishing. So in the latest version, there's about 13,000 entries that are also in Biko, but with many corrections, so there's corrections not in Biko and they're not in any other Lakota dictionary. So where do these words come from? So here's one of the contributors. And this is Mary Ann Redcloud. So here's up here. And then it's used in a sentence. So when there's example sentences given, it's not, it's not just made up. It actually comes from a speaker. And so I'll play the Wait, I'll turn the speakers up here. Oh, you six now. Here's another example. This comes from Dolores Kills in Water. on the recordings, but you can see that they all come from those sentences that those Lakota language speakers used. And so I can't, I can't explain to you how important that is to have example sentences when you're using a dictionary. Stand over here. Okay, so the, uh, so like I said, all the examples, Deloria. So in 2012, uh, all of the words in the dictionary were recorded by, was participated, there's over 55,000 audio clips, four weeks to record all the words. And it provided another opportunity to check the dictionary. Ben Black Bear, 
recording. He's one of the male voices on there. The other one is Alan. He's sitting back there. Oh. <laughs> Baby bear. Yep. Yeah. So the uh, New Lakota Dictionary is a reliable resource. So, so when you think about all the other dictionaries that are out there, that's, that's really an accomplishment. It's the first Lakota Dictionary with consistent spelling. It comes from authentic narratives. 30,000 entries, 15,000 more in this truly reliable Lakota Dictionary. And I go back to, I always use Uncle John as an example because he always, he always pushed for the language, for language revitalization. In 1992, both him and Rudy Fire Thunder, they themselves, they contributed uh, a lot of the research and stuff for them. Johnson Holy Rock, Ben Black Bear, Robert Tucro. So a lot of these names that, um, that worked on it. So Standing Rock, when they, they thought so much of it that they gave Obama a dictionary as a gift. Wonk, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot, there's, a, it's, it's, I don't know. I mean, to me, it's, it's like a really, like a wealth of information. And there's a lot of cultural things in there too. And it spans all across the communities in Lakota. Times of Red Cloud, Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull. From the times of our ancestors, there's, there's stuff in there. Okay, so is there a realistic alternative? I, I don't think so. And I can tell you from myself as a second link that was self-taught as well. And we both agree that if a lot of this material was around back when we were, when we were learning, when we were uh, teaching ourselves, we would have been like probably for improvement. And if we find typos or errors, then uh, we need to address them specifically. And another thing is recording. Laura, I know, has been going around and, and interviewing different people and getting those recordings. And eventually, those could all be mentation uh, is to avoid criticism and contribute something constructive. Because this is really, like I said, as far as materials go, there's, there's nothing of, of where we're at in Lakota language right now in the revitalization effort. Is that when it comes fall time, and winter's coming, we all look at our tires and we think that, okay, our tires are gonna be four new tires and you know there's a bad snowstorm coming. You're gonna wanna change those tires, right? Because we don't wanna be slipping and sliding. They're the best materials because there's a storm coming that aren't really pushing or really uh, interested in learning Lakota language and that's perfectly fine. They're still Lakota, they still live here. But the few that are, we have to do something for them. We have to. And so, like I said, Laura's been doing this. I've helped her out a little bit, uh, going around to uh, interview different elders in Lakota. And it's really interesting when you hear about them explaining pretty funny. Some of it's been pretty good. And so as a testimony, I can tell you that for the uh, next year will be 10 years and for me teaching Lakota language, and the last students don't have access to all the orthography, so I'm, you're kind of working double to try to do as much as you can for them. But it's been like a night and day. And so it's inspired me. Uh, when you hear somebody at the beginning of a semester don't know anything, and then by the end of the semester, they're speaking in, in sentences, you can see them selecting words and not memorization, like three hours a week with them, right, for the class. And so it's nothing that I'm doing, that's all their hard work. Like we just show them the stuff in the classroom, but they're actually pushing themselves outside of the classroom. And that's, that's the thing that I'm most proud of is that if you can make it fun, if you can make it uh, with my kids, I can do this with my, my spouse. And that's, what, that's where all the work is done at the home. So this is, uh, this is one of my students. Now, this is Lawika. I'm mean, so proud because she was really nervous at the beginning of the semester. She was really quiet. And over, over the semester, she really came out of her shell more as she kind of um, gained more language, language ability. And so um, I'll just kind of explain what she's doing. 
And so what is she doing is we have all these different animals that are set up. And, um, and I have video of, I, I select the animal for them, they have to describe it. And so on this one, I just let her pick because this is her final video, so she could just pick whichever one she wanted. And so she's gonna an animal, the things she eats, drinks, the way she uh, lives her life. And then when she's done, she's just gonna like talk about what she's wearing. And, but you now you have to, this as a, for a language teacher, you have to keep in mind, this is somebody that did not speak. College Center, April 30th, 2019. This is Lawika Waihak, Unidni College Center, April 30th, 2019. Oh, God. <laughs> Nabe <laughs> is really bashful to do that but she did so good she did so well and so and there's something interesting uh, as a teacher because she's not only describing that stuff about as an animal what she has as an animal she's some in some of them she's describing what she doesn't to see that okay uh 
did you need to switch? Okay, so Laura's gonna do her presentation. I wanna thank you guys for that. Um, I think we need to take just a, a quick break so she can put it on, she can transfer it to her PowerPoint or 